Hey guys, and welcome back to the Mud Studs and Skull Caps podcast. I'm Robin. And I'm Kelsey. And in today's episode, we're going to turn to science to try and answer the question, does your horse like to be groomed? While you may think the answer is obvious, you might be surprised at the scientific community's findings when it comes to grooming your horse. Okay guys, don't forget to check out last week's episode to learn all about the man in the ear and how you can control your horse's brainwaves with your tack. Confused? That's okay. Just go and listen to last week's episode about wearable combing devices to find out what the heck I'm even talking about. Of course, don't forget to scroll down to the bottom of your podcast page on the Apple Podcast app to leave us a review. So by leaving a review, sharing with a friend, and subscribing, you are helping to support us and make sure other listeners can find us on the app. I did see a review this week that called us normal people, and I got pretty excited about that. What? So thank you for everyone who has left a, <laughs> left us a review. We truly appreciate it, and thanks for listening, and enjoy this episode. Yes, and now to get into this week's, I guess, kind of our product. We kind of are going through various products of the week, looking into them, and looking into the research behind them, what there is, and so many products that have absolutely no research behind them. This week's, we were looking at the hands-on gloves. I know both of us own our own pairs, and you use yours quite regularly, don't you? I use mine almost every single day. <laughs> <laughs> I Actually, this is one of the few products that I, we've Actually, not one of the few. Some of these I've owned for a long time. But yeah, I've owned these ones. They were a Christmas present, actually. Thank you, Robin, for the, for the Christmas oh, present. Oh, yeah, they were from me. Go me. Yeah, go you. Awesome. My horses really <laughs> appreciate that. You know what's funny is uh, the pair that I own were given to me as a Christmas present, too. I think they're like a really common Christmas present. So if yours, if you've gotten a pair for Christmas and they're still sitting like hidden somewhere in your tack room because you're like too embarrassed to pull them out pull them out they're actually kind of cool and your horse most horses really really like them train does not like them but fletch he'll find me if i have the gloves on he's like here check out my butt want to go to itch and i'm like okay i guess here i am just here to itch your butt for you buddy oh that's so he only turns his butt like i know a lot of horses turn their butt but my horses always bring their neck to me which is the preferred sight which we'll talk about in a minute but they always present their preferred sight to me so he has two areas that he wants to be scratched at. He likes just right on top of his tail, like right there. Mm -hmm. He really wants itched a lot because I don't think he can actually get it himself. Whereas he also wants his neck to be itched and like right in front of his withers. But he has used my fence plenty to get that spot, unfortunately. Gotcha. My horses definitely use the fence for their butt, but I don't think they use it for their for their neck at all. Yeah, but I was looking into the patents and stuff of these gloves and – I actually, okay, I found two. The one was the patent for the hands-on gloves by Jay Michelson, which his patent was filed back in August 2018 and appears to be a 15-year-long patent. So it's going to be a while before you see anybody else, any other brand pulling out his design. There's a lot of grooming gloves already like out there, but I do think I prefer his the most. I do like his the most. His are very unique and interesting, but I thought his patent was super weird like i don't know if it's weird unique or smart opposed to all these other patents we've been looking into like i know last week when we looked at the liquid titanium stuff mm -hmm. she had like tons of experiments done and like studies referenced in her patent and all these different claims and was like talking about how good this product is whereas in the hands-on gloves it it's only one sentence and like oh, two yeah. images that's it i mean they're grooming gloves like how much do you need to say like i think it's funny though because like out of all the massage gloves out there on the market his is by far the shortest patent and that's all it is it, like the entire sentence is the ornamental design for an animal bathing and grooming glove as shown and described so that's all like i mean it's kind of smart because now no one can hold him accountable for making any false sta statements or claims well in it yeah in his patent but i mean we all know how marketing works <laughs> Yeah, their, their website pushes it to build the bond between you and your horse. Yes, and that's not quite possible, but that's okay. We appreciate the attempt. <laughs> we appreciate the Hollywoodization of anything involving horses. Yes, yes, that creating that beautiful bond, that running through fields together, chasing each other. It's not just that. It's when you make eye contact with one another across the pasture. They see you, you see them, immediately your heart and soul are linked. Yeah, it doesn't quite work that way, but... Yeah, and then the only other uh, patent I looked at was by Ruth Ann Stoswiski. Stoswiski? Stoswiski. 
Ruth Ann and her therapeutic massage and handling gloves. And hers are really just uh, meant to be like a dual purpose glove that instead of having to like take off your gloves to scratch your horse is these are gloves that you can be doing manual labor around the barn as well as scratching the horse with. Which I am like super supportive of because I usually take my grooming gloves out when I'm going to like clean stalls and clean paddocks and I have to have like a pair of work gloves in my pocket so I can switch back and forth, which is annoying because sometimes like a glove falls out and I lose a glove and then a horse finds a glove. Like it's a whole thing. So it'd be (laughs) cool to have like a pair, but I don't know like I like the palm. I like where all the nubs are, so I don't want to, like, lose any of my, like, grooming nubs. I'd also love a pair I could ride in. I would be stu- – like, that just had nubs on the fingers or something. That would be cool. Oh, that'd be – that'd be weird. Well, just so, like, because I'd want to give, like, a reward, a scratch reward while I'm riding, and I would, like – my horses like the gloves more than just me scratching them. So I did find one patent, and I wanted to share my patent with you real quick. Oh, that's right. So I found a patent from 1882 for grooming gloves. So this is in by like this is not a new invention. People have been grooming with their gloves for quite a while. These gloves have instead of like the rubber cray comb nubs, they have bristle, like a whole bunch of little bristles on the hands or like the palm part and the fingers. On the tips of the fingers are these like little wire caps you could put on and you can use them to either like pick out the hooves or I think horses would love a nice scratch with them. And then on the back where the knuckles are is a bunch of like metal uh, plates that you can use to clean out, clean out the gloves or, or protect yourself in a street fight. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, brass knuckles be damned. I got the grooming yeah, gloves Yeah, I got grooming now. gloves, yo. <laughs> uh, they're pretty scary looking. They are pretty intimidating. But I thought it was really interesting that back in 1882, they were trying to rethr- rethink the grooming game. Um, And I do love the language they use in the older patents because it starts out like the beginning of the patent is to all whom it may concern, be it known that I, Robert W. Thompson of Eastport County, Cuyahoga and the state of Ohio have invented a new and useful improvement in gloves for grooming purposes. And I do hereby declare that the following (laughs) is a full, clear and exact description of the same. So I just love how, like... I do declare. Yeah, they're very... Take their patents very seriously in the 1880s. So I thought that was interesting. That these have been around for a while. But we should probably dive in now to, like, the research and stuff. Like, one of the biggest things that I thought... Like, the biggest qualms that I had when I was going through the hands-on website and everything was that they kept making these statements claiming that it enables a bonding experience between the animals in our lives or it strengthens your bond with your horse first off like bonding is just such a uh, such a hollywood term now that i feel like it's gotten so twisted out of context and it's almost like a joke of a term when i think of it now that that was kind of what i was looking into a little bit with some of the studies that i was finding and there was actually one study that i was reading that looked into horse on horse grooming And it was super recent. It was just accepted in August of this year and then published September 3rd, 2020. So like a few months ago, super recent. But they looked into wild horses. It was a wild horse herd in Japan. And they looked into kind of the circumstances that come about when they groom either one another, which they were calling mutual grooming, or when they would do self-grooming, which would be rolling, itching, whatever, grooming themselves. Mm -hmm. And when they were looking into... The mutual grooming, they looked into, first off, the genders, who was grooming who, as well as, like, when this was coming about. So was it grooming after, like, an aggressive act? Were they grooming when they were just standing close to one another? Were they only grooming their family members? And they started looking into all of this stuff and, like, these different factors, which I thought was super interesting. And what they found was horses don't groom each other to repair relationships. They don't groom each other after, like, an aggressive act has just happened. They don't immediately come to make up with one another and start grooming. Like, that's not how they use it at all. They use it if they're already close with one another. So it's not – there was no um, real correlation between kinship and the rate at which they groom one another. That didn't really have any ties to it. It was more or less who they spent the most time with, not necessarily proximity-wise, but, like, who they were closest with, they've had friendships or already had a relationship with. And they would then groom each other to just kind of strengthen or reaffirm that relationship. I think that's really interesting, especially when you start to talk about the horse to human bond. Because, right, we, a lot of the beliefs and a lot of the studies, you know, we looked into and we'll share in a second, 
look at can grooming be used to create a bond or strengthen a bond between horse and human and a lot of the science is saying no but it's interesting that the social interactions in a wild herd seem to support that as well that they're not using this to repair the relationship they are already close and are already friends and then they will groom and it's not a way to say i'm sorry or to make up for for what happened so i think that's it's consistent with what i think the the scientific research you know, in in a lab setting is finding. Yeah. And I mean, they also groom each other to help remove parasites and like shedding season. So they did mention that certain times of the year, grooming is going to be more prominent because, sure. hello, they're shedding. They're itchy. They, yes. They're like, hey, <laughs> mate, scratch my back. I'll scratch yours. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's a good point. I, yeah, I mean, my horses, our domestic horses do the same thing. There's a lot more grooming, I think, around shedding season. Right now, no one's shedding. And so they just like start grooming and then after a second of grooming each other, they start fighting. <laughs> like they just can't can't be nice to one another. <laughs> they get they get really moody. Like, yeah, you bit too hard. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah, they're a little moody right now. Another thing that I thought was super interesting about this study was that it talked about the different um not breeds, oh my gosh, genders of horses. <laughs> so like it's her talking about how most of the grooming occurred either mayor on mayor mm-hmm. or mayor to stallion. Yeah. So it wasn't it was never stallions grooming stallions. And I think that's super interesting because I wonder about domestic horses. I would still wonder with stallions, you know, are they going to have the same aversion and not wanting to be groomed as a wild stallion? I mean, they groom a mayor when they're at, like during mating season and stuff, but I don't know if they're ever really looking to get that grooming back and they're never grooming one another. The understanding is that how herds react is – or wild horse herds react, is that it's mare on mare grooming and then the stallion that's trying to mate with the mares, he's also doing grooming. And that the boys, the the stallions don't ever groom each other. But just thinking to my own herd, like my boys groom each other. They're both geldings. Um, One was a stallion until he was 11 or 12, so for quite a while. And he, I mean, they all groom each other. Hudson's still a baby. So do you think that grooming behavior is going to change as Hudson grows? And gets older. So he, like, the way him and Nim interact is more like two boys constantly fighting. And so, like, they initiate grooming as, like, a way to, like, rustle, wrestle, you know? Like, they're more of, like, they want to play fight. And Addie, like, doesn't want to play fight with Hudson. So she, they don't really initiate grooming those two very often. They do, like, their interactions are totally different. They, like, kiss each other's faces. I don't know what they're doing, but they, like, do face stuff. <laughs> and then Nim and Hudson uh, try to try to groom each other and then fight. <laughs> I found it really interesting looking at the various studies and, like, it was kind of weird how many of them used wild horses yeah. instead or, like, only semi-domesticated horses for these experiments to see if grooming was beneficial. And I kind of understand where they're coming from so like one of the studies i was reading that happened back in 1993 they viewed 38 grooming sequences in a herd of 13 mares nine stallions and they saw where the preferred grooming spots were and then they took that information and replicated it on domestic horses to see what was happening heart rate wise with the horses and like facial expression a little bit and seeing you know what kind of reactions were the wild horses creating when they were doing this on these exact locations. And so what they found was that the preferred location they found with the wild horses was at the base of the neck, right in front of the withers. And when I started looking into the nerve mapping, because I thought some of that information is super interesting, that right in front of the withers, that area correlates with the dorsal nerves. And like, it's just this massive bundle of nerves. And what I was reading was suggesting that Going back to like last week's episode of the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system is that by like scratching that or itching it or, you know, stimulating that area is it could be sending like calming waves through the horse's body and activating the parasympathetic nervous system a little bit. Interesting. Which is super interesting because what they found was that when you groom the horse in the preferred area was there was a drop in heart rate, Mm -hmm. which would indicate a calming nature or a calming effect from scratching in this one spot. They also groom the horses based on a not preferred area, which was just like kind of the front of the shoulder, like lower down on the shoulder. Mm-hmm. And they found that the heart rate increased if they groomed the preferred spot and then they went to the non preferred spot and groomed it. The heart rate of the horse increased significantly. So there, there was a change grooming wise. And I 
couldn't help but wonder, like, you know, when you see horses and they're play fighting or in the wild and they kind of go lower down the legs and it's a way to incapacitate their opponent. I was wondering if maybe that was the cause, but these were domesticated horses. So I don't like, I don't know if that carries over. It's so hard because I know like each horse also has like their own specific itchy spot that they prefer. Yeah. I mean, we, I think almost all horses also probably like 90% of horses love right in front of the withers or like right in front of like the base of the neck. They love that location. My horse is Hudson loves his chest being scratched. Like that's one of his favorite spots, which is supposed to supposedly the area that increases the horse's heart rate. So I have like kind of an issue with that study as well as the other heart rate study that's referenced all the time because there's, there's a lot of factors that go into these studies. But part of the problem, and this happens I think constantly with all our horse studies, is they're not using statistically big enough sample sizes. So usually you need to have a sample size of about 30 subjects in order to get a in order to get information that you can apply to a more broader population. And so when you're using eight horses or just a couple horses, that information you're getting isn't broad enough to apply to the rest of the population, especially when you have such a diverse amount of breeds and disciplines and horses that have been domesticated and, you know, or have been feral more recently, that that information is, I think, really hard to apply broadly. Yeah, I actually, I never thought about the sample size before, but that would totally make sense. I mean, because especially in a group of 16 or so horses, it's very easy for an outlier to still affect the results and make it appear as though something is happening across all of them with the averages when in reality, it's probably not. Correct. Or it's skewing it more than it should be. Correct. Yeah. So that's why it is recommended that you have 30 participants or 30 subjects at your minimum. And then obviously the larger the sample size, the better it is at reflecting and sort of balancing those variables out. But the other one, other study I did want to mention real quick is it's a 2003 study titled The Effect of Manual Limit." imitation of grooming on riding horses heart rate in different environmental situations. So this study is also referred to very frequently. And what they did is they took 16 riding horses. They took them into a room that was typically only used for medical procedures. They hooked them up to some heart rate monitoring equipment and they groomed these horses. Well, they took their heart rate when they first came in and they found that their heart rate, the average heart rate for this group of 16 was about 51 beats per minute. And when they started grooming them on the preferred location, it dropped to 40 beats per minute. But The big issue I have with this study is that, you know, yes, they groomed these horses in all of these locations, including the shoulder and the hip, which were found in the study that you previously talked about to increase the heart rate. They decreased the heart rate in this study. But the problem is they took these horses into a clinic, a situation where this horse is very nervous and very tense and probably has an exaggerated heartbeat, and then kindly touched them instead of stabbing them for vaccines or beginning a treatment. So I feel like the results you're seeing is a horse saying, thank God you're not stabbing me right now. Like, thank God I'm not getting a vaccine. Thank God I'm not getting, you know, my of some type of invasive vet procedure. So I have a huge issue with this is because I don't think that's a fair, you know, and like that I they only did this study once. They didn't repeat it over and over. Yes, they had a bit bigger of a population with 16 horses. But yes, touching your horse kindly when they are extremely stressed out probably will (laughs) relax them. Well, so the other part of the study was then they had eight horses that were in their barns who were being brushed at home in a place that they were used to. And tiny little population only did this once. They found that the horses started their control heart rate was 33 beats per minute. And when they were scratched on the neck, it dropped to 32 32 at both the hips and the withers. So that tells me a horse that's not stressed out at all, that's being groomed, its heart rate dropped a little bit less than a beat because it's like not off. It's 33.31 and then 32.67. Yeah. Less than a beat when they were at home and already relaxed. So to me, these are two totally different situations. I think you're seeing a horse that's extremely stressed out reacting to something differently. 
those extremely stressed horses, their expectations of having something horrible happen did not occur. Therefore, they were able to start calming down when they realized they're just going to be standing here with a person scratching them. Also, one thing I really wonder about, because I don't think it mentioned it in either of these. Well, actually, I don't know about yours, but it didn't mention it in mine, how long they groom for to get these results. Okay. Which I think could really determine something. You know, if you groom for 20 minutes, sure, now your horse is going to be relaxed because everything their body has gone through, they've already gone through and now they're coming down from it. This study did talk about that there was no significant change in heart rate when the horse was at rest and they began grooming the non-preferred area, but the heart rate did lower when the horse was at rest and they began grooming the preferred site. Interesting. Which I think that would kind of correlate almost with your the study that you brought, you're going to bring up next, which is the oxytocin. Mm-hmm. Things going on in the body aren't always what we're seeing on the outside. Right. Right. But yeah, I, so this study I saw referenced multiple times in people. There was another study that I wanted to talk about but then realized it wasn't very complete the person who did the other study they wanted to know if grooming your horse could cool your horse down because this study the one i just talked about the manual imitation of grooming on riding horses they want to know if this study because it showed a decrease in heart rate does that mean you could also groom your horse to cool them down for instead of walking oh weird (laughs) And their study was not complete enough for me to, like, agree with their conclusions. Their conclusion was yes, but, like, they only did three horses or four horses. Yeah, it was, like, four horses, and they only did it one time, lunged a horse for three minutes, and then groomed the horse for, like, a minute. And they found that, yes, it worked. (laughs) And I was like, well, okay, that's not a study. That's, like, a very quick, like, perhaps we could – perhaps there's something to investigate there. But I don't think this study can be applied to – I just didn't feel like the study was saying what that person, the cooling down study, wanted it to say. I feel like there are so many factors to go into that that they did not even consider. Like, let's maybe take 10 minutes of hard work Uh and then grooming them. And is it the grooming that's cooling them down or is it the fact that they're no longer exercising? (laughs) Yeah, so they – I think they did it once they lunged the horse for three minutes and groomed it. And then once they lunged the horse for three minutes and walked it. But, like, could the horse just be standing and get the same results versus walking? So they, there was, like, there's a lot there to that cooling down study. And because it was so incomplete, I didn't want to, like, dig into it. Um, but this was a study that they referenced was this one saying, well, it decreased the horse's heart rate. And I just – the other study we're going to share in a minute, horses that are relaxed, it doesn't. Horse, This is a horse that's extremely stressed out. Is stress the same as working out? Probably not. Hopefully yeah. not. I mean, I know working out is supposed to release other hormones that are feel-good hormones. So these probably aren't the same situation. So one of the other studies I looked into was a 2018 study titled Facial Expression and Oxytocin as Possible Markers of Positive Emotions in Horses. So this is a more recent study, and they had two groups of horses. So they had 27 Welsh mares that had been basically not handled by humans a ton leading up to the situation. They've been living in a herd and they were halter broke three months prior to the study being conducted. And they broke them into two different groups. One that was going to get the gentle grooming, which is like social grooming, responding to what the horse wants in a certain location. And then there was standard grooming, which is basically what we have all been taught to do, where you um, groom the horse starting with the curry comb and the hard brush, soft brush, then you brush the legs, the curry comb doesn't go on the legs. Like they laid out all the grooming rules we know. So they wanted (laughs) to compare just regular typical grooming to this more social mutual grooming. And what they wanted to look at was what is the horse's expressions, what is their facial emotions, and what is their oxytocin hormone level. And what was oxytocin? Yeah, before we get into the study, let's talk about what oxytocin is. So I did find a 2015 article titled Oxytocin Facts About the Cuddle Hormone. (laughs) So (laughs) oxytocin is a hormone that is secreted by your pituitary gland, which is the same gland that causes Cushing's. Um, Oh, interesting. Same one. Yeah, I don't know if that like having Cushing's or PPID, does that affect your oxytocin? I don't know. Are Cushing's horses less cuddly? <laughs> Do they not? Do they not want to bond with you? It is basically, oxytocin is often referred to as the cuddle hormone or the love hormone. Um, and this is because it's released often when people are snuggling up or trying to bond socially. So even like playing with your dog can cause an increase in oxytocin. And oxytocin can also intes- intensify memories of bonding gone bad. So 
such as in cases where men have poor relationships with their mothers. It can also make people less accepting of people they see as outsiders. In other words, whether oxytocin makes you feel cuddly or suspicious really depends on the environment and when it's being triggered. Oxytocin, that hormone is also triggered when you breastfeed your baby. So that's what like bonds a mom to their baby. And oxytocin is also like very involved with the reproductive system of horses and humans, often released during labor. And it it has a lot to do with like that mother-child bond as well. So oxytocin is basically the bonding hormone. It's what's released when a bond is being developed. So that's why the researchers wanted to look at was oxytocin Did it increase or decrease? What were the levels when we did this social grooming versus when we did standard grooming? Um, I have a question. With the standard grooming, they did the entire body of the horse. Did they do the entire body of the horse with the other type? So they, yes and no. They had preferred sites. So they mapped a couple preferred sites on the horse's body and also brushed the horse's legs. But they responded when the horse told them that they liked like liked a certain location more. So for gentle grooming during each each session, grooming involved using the hands to scratch the neck, the head, back, belly, and hindquarters, and finishing on each leg. When the horse demonstrated approach behaviors regarding a particular area, the experimenter focused on this zone for longer and increased the pressure. When the horse showed no, no reaction for 30 seconds or showed an avoidance, the experimenter decreased the pressure and changed to another zone. Okay. So they were basically responding to like what was the horse telling them, but they did break the body into zones to try to get the entire body groomed. Um, and I think there's a couple other experiments that break break them into zones. And there's the similar zones that the heart rate study we just talked about broke them into. So horses were groomed for 10 minutes, six days in a row, one day off, and then five days again. Horses were cross-tied in the middle of their arena. They had a buddy who was a few feet away from them so they could like – feel comfortable and not alone. And then none of the other horses were able to see the grooming. So there was no social eavesdropping occurring. No cheating. No cheating. Well, ho- yeah, horses can watch interactions with like a third party and then apply that to their own their own life. And they can learn from watching others. So they didn't want any of the horses to, uh, to learn to like it by watching it. Which is so strange all on its own. It makes me think about like anytime my horse is watching me ride by on somebody else or something or like working with another horse in the arena what they were processing and learning oh so so weird (laughs) you are always being watched and even if you're not working with that other horse with your horse or the whoever's watching you are always training or untraining everybody who can see you (laughs) which is not daunting in the least (laughs) oh my god this totally makes me think like this is another reason to board your horse at home i that just hit me oh my goodness because you don't know what your horse is watching during the day. You don't know what they're seeing. Oh, I'm sure she's seen some horrible things. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. No, I'm sure. My poor And my poor mare was stuck in a stall for a year in the main barn watching everyone go by. I'm sure she's seen some scary things. Anyways, so the conclusion of the two different grooming experiments, the gentle grooming or social grooming and then the standard grooming, they found that those horses that were in the gentle grooming group eagerly sought human contact and never expressed discomfort or defensive behaviors. In contrast, the horses in a standard grooming group presented numerous discomfort, defensive, and avoidance behaviors. One group, right, the one that did the social grooming and who's the, who the groomer, the experimenter listened to, because I think that's important to know, is that they were being listened to, and when they said they didn't like a specific area, the experimenter changed their behavior. They showed that they were happier. Their facial expressions showed that they were happier versus the standard group whose opinion wasn't taken into consideration, nor were those preferred sites targeted. They showed that they were unhappy. A lot of that included, you know, being that tight mouth, twitching ears, one ear monitoring constantly, open eyes, uh, neck higher in that standard group with the gentle group, they were lower neck carriage, eyes were half closed, their upper lips were extended, um, and they were either immobile or their ears twitched and pointed uh, backwards, almost in line with the nose. So not like flat back, but just listening back. So when they looked at their heart rate and their oxytocin levels, they basically found there was no difference in either of these groups. So even though the standard group was showing facial expressions of upset and discomfort, it did not change their heart rate, nor did it change the levels of cortisol, which is the stress hormone, or oxytocin. I do think it's important to note that cortisol works 
the research is starting to suggest that cortisol is not the only stress hormone and that there could be other stress hormones being released. Cortisol is just like the most tested one. And I don't know if the same applies to oxytocin, if there are other other hormones that are going to be released that indicate pleasure, um, but oxytocin is the bonding hormone. So no bonding was occurring between the horses and the groomer, despite the type of grooming that was occurring. But see, that makes me so curious that obviously for there to be, I mean, think about your own facial expression. When you smile, that releases certain endorphins that make you happier. So I can't imagine that a horse that's just clearly showing in their facial expressions and in their body that they're feeling something different with the different types of grooming, that something else isn't happening in their body. Right. And I think but I think that goes back to, I think, the study we were talking about like two weeks ago with the foaming in the mouth and how researchers for so long have only been focusing on cortisol as the stress indicator and that it hasn't been until the last year or so where researchers have started to say, hey, horses could release be releasing up to 10 different hormones all at one time and each level indicates something else, that it's... There's much more yeah. nuance to the horse's behaviors, you know, their emotional behaviors, their facial expressions, as well as what's happening with the nervous system. And that's why it's much more than just like the sympathetic nervous system is on or off, right? It's there's that dial you talked about. And when you're turning that dial, you're adding different amounts of hormones as that dial turns. The thing is, we now need to move past cortisol as being the only measure of stress and have to start realizing that or cortisol and heart rate are not the only indicators of stress. You can have facial expressions that indicate stress without physical expressions indicating stress, but that there's probably a whole range of other hormones that are being secreted and released that are stressing or your stress hormones or or relaxation hormones yeah i also wonder because this is something that we constantly see happening in these studies is that a lot of times things are happening in a human's body under the same circumstances we take that and apply it to a horse yeah sure. so i wonder you know with the differences in how a horse's brain is made up and like their range of emotions that they can feel is oxytocin the same cuddling hormone in them as it is in us like is it still a bonding hormone in a horse that it is in the humans or is it like to have its own different levels you know yeah and that that's a good point you know what level of oxytocin if we do agree it's a cuddle hormone what level in a horse indicates it's a bonding hormone versus what level in a human indicates it's bonding is that what you're trying to say that yeah one could be a five and the other could be like a 20 right because we could be looking at these hormones that we know in humans bodies indicate this and we're trying to apply it to the horse's body but what if oxytocin in their body is not necessary? like it obviously links to like similar areas, but what if it's not activating the emotions and like feeling of bonding or contentment that we think it is? So this study does talk a little bit in the beginning about how we have so long just looked at horses' emotions as either being angry or like afraid or being you know happy or content and that horses and animals can only feel those two emotions as researchers that if we're saying horses only have two feelings they're either good or they're bad then we're only looking for two hormones and so we're only applying those two hormones good the good one and the bad one and we have to keep right keep broadening and broadening and i think we're gonna get there we're just not there yet that's true things are coming out all the time Right, and that was a two, this is a 2018 study. So that's still, I mean, that's fairly recent. The, those other heart rate studies were, you know, 93, 2003, and they're still being referenced um, and used a lot. And their, their findings are still being the basis of other studies' findings. I think it's going to be a long time before people start to realize that this study should be used as the basis of, you know, looking at different bonding hormones or different relaxation or good hormones oh my gosh i just realized one of my other studies also references the one from 1993 about decreasing a horse's heart rate with certain grooming they all reference it yeah that's the they oh all my reference gosh it. well and then if they don't reference the 93 one and they reference the 2003 one which the 2003 one references the 93 one but like that's the thing all these studies are you know calling back to studies that were done like 10 years prior and saying this is the basis and i think part of that is just like getting funding and getting you yeah. know, trying to to establish the need for these studies does. I mean, I think grooming seems to be one of the the more researched 
areas in horses that we've looked at so far is that there does seem to be a significant amount spent trying to understand the bond between horse and, and human and horse and horse. It's just there's it's still there's a lot more questions. There's always more questions and always more you know variables and parameters to look at. Oh, I know. I have so many more questions now than I did when I started and like so many less answers. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's that's the problem is the more you know, the less you know. So taking this study and trying to apply it to my horses and to my situation, I think I'm going to be much more conscious about how I'm grooming them and making sure that they do. And I know this is a touchy word, but consent. I think we have to remember that it's not always what we want, that we have to be conscious of their comfort levels. And I think there is a way to bring social grooming and that more mutual preferred grooming in and not just kind of groom them off real quick in order to ride. That we have to be a little bit more conscious from the time we enter the the property um, to the time we're grooming, to the time we're riding, to the time we're leaving. Is that we have to be much more mindful and present the entire time. Which I think is so interesting and such a like slap in the face, duh, moment. Because how many times growing up did you say, like, because I know a Trin. I've had it so many times where I'm like, oh, she doesn't like, just doesn't like to be groomed. And I know she has a favorite brush and I know the spot she likes to be groomed. Yeah. But I always like discount that in favor. Well, I got to get you clean. So you just got to suck it up and get over it. And it's like, well. I think, you know, we're just so, I mean, the standard grooming is textbook grooming. And that's what we for so long have been trying to replicate is like what was in the Pony Club manuals. And if, you know, you're not. A pony clubber, you're definitely taught at a barn or taught from someone the right way to groom. Nowhere in the right way to groom was the horse's needs yeah. or their preferences ever taken into consideration. Like we know, don't go down below the knee without with the curry comb. Like we know that one and avoid the flanks because those are our sensitive areas. But like nowhere do we ever say the horse loves to be groomed here. So take extra time and care to groom these locations. That's not part of the Pony Club manual. That's not part of any book on how to groom a horse or part of most uh, riding school classes. It's just frustrating starting to look into the studies and everything and realizing how much we're just we're told. And we say, yep, OK, take that and live the rest of our lives with that information without ever like taking a second look at it really yeah because you think you are doing it the right way so why would you question it like you've been doing it the right way and someone else told you it was the right way and I think a lot of it comes down to like time management a lot of this I think is being triggered by time and management you go to the money yeah I mean you go to the barn to ride your horse you don't go to the barn to like spend 20 minutes grooming and 10 minutes walking right like that's not why you're going to the barn that's not why you own a horse most of us bought a horse so we could ride a horse and sort of trying to change that perspective of it is hard because it's not where the majority of horse owners lie the majority of horse owners want to ride they want to show and they want to compete and that is fabulous and that is fine and you can do both you can, you know, be more conscious of how you're grooming your horse so it's a more enjoyable experience and he doesn't learn to hate the cross ties. Do you, like, what are your final conclusions then on grooming? I've got several other studies that I don't know that we have time to get into today. The research all concludes the same. Grooming does not create a bond, whether it's between social, like, or between wild horses or domestic horses and people. Like, there's no bond being created. Not something that wild horses spend a ton of their time doing. It's not a huge part of their life and their daily routine. Yes, my horses have itchy spots and I'm absolutely going to scratch and pay attention to their itchy spots. I'm going to do a lot less of like, my grooming sessions are probably going to get a lot longer. Like that's the biggest takeaway is that yes, my horse still needs to be clean so I can put tack on them. But I'm also going to make sure that they're getting what they want out of the session as well. Okay. I can see that. The one thing that I wonder, you know, a lot of this I feel like is all started and they test, you know, groom the horse, horse like it, horse don't like it. But no one ever – I wonder like if there's a test that you could do on positive reinforcement and like reinforcing that grooming is a good thing. Now, I'm not saying like it's going to create this bond between you and a horse – But I wonder if there's a way to, like, teach the horse that grooming is good 
that way, like when you start grooming them, no matter where on their body, they start to relax and they get a lower heart rate. So you probably can do that because some of the other studies I looked into were absolutely comparing using food to grooming. What does your horse like most? And the findings are, and the, the truth is oxytocin is also released during feeding. Food can release oxytocin. Therefore, those people who choose to use treats to work with their horses and bond with their horses, and this is in these studies were constructed. I don't want to say they're they're not just like hand feeding horses until like the horse got all the cookies they wanted, right? There was a lot of structure to this, and those people who use positive reinforcement training with treats, there's a lot of structure to it. But those horses that were trained in that method had a greater bond to their person, and re- and I don't know if they released oxytocin more. I don't recall that off the top of my head, but I do know oxytocin was looked at during these studies. I just can't remember what the specific oxytocin results were, but they did find that the bond was greater to the between the horse and human that used food in training than used just scratches in training. Oh, it's all very interesting and very confusing. It makes me think about so many things. Like, I mean, like the previous stuff that we've thought about with giving a horse treats you're told that you're like bribing your horse or something of that nature and that's just not true anymore (laughs) okay yeah i was thinking about this the other day anyone who tells you that giving your horse treats is bribing them good luck like and you can't bribe a horse like think about that horse that doesn't want to get in the trailer so you get a bucket of grain and you shake the bucket of grain did that horse get in the trailer did that bucket of grain override their fear of their trailer and get them in no like, I'm sorry. We all know that that doesn't work to get the horse into the trailer. The horse that does get in the trailer for food is not a horse that's scared of the trailer. <laughs> like, that's a horse that is either, like, just doesn't want to, has something else going on, or is used to the food and is waiting for the food to get into the trailer. You can't bribe a horse to do anything. Like, I'm sorry. <laughs> it doesn't work. Looking at these studies and looking at how some of them were looking at, like, does grooming work as a reward? And one of the studies I was finding suggests that no, it doesn't. Grooming, in fact, doesn't release enough like positive reinforcement for it to count as positive reinforcement and to increase the horse's ability to learn something in a training environment, which is so interesting because I've always been of the mind that like I'm starting off like training and teaching with treats right now, but eventually we're going to wean off of it to where they just need scratches and you know, they're going to be willing to be in my area, my space enough and like good enough bond that all they need from me is scratches for confirmation of praise. And I think eventually you might be able to teach that. That's just not how their system works. I mean, think about it in the wild. What do they go for more? They go after food. They don't seek each other out all the time for grooming. That is more in unfrequent activity. Whereas food that happens every single day, multiple times a day for like several hours. Okay, so you were missing a small piece, though, with the positive reinforcement. And the positive reinforcement is that the horse gets that reward um, and that good feeling when they get the treat and that he starts to place that good feeling not on the treat itself but on the experience with you. Like, So for Addie, she's at the point where I have a freebie bucket in my paddock when I'm teaching her positive reinforcement. And she could go and eat from that freebie bucket or she could come and work with me. She chooses every time to come work with me and leave a full bucket of treats. It's the exact same treats, the exact same hay pellets that are in the bucket that are in my pouch. She'll leave and come come work with me because she'd rather work with me. That's more fun. Now, if she gets frustrated while we're working and she doesn't get the treat when she thinks she should get the treat, she'll go to her freebie bucket and grab it and then come back. And th- I think there's a lot to it and that to the positive reinforcement and using food versus scratches. Which is like, that's my biggest qualm with a lot of these studies also is that they're using not necessarily domesticate a horse or they're using like a horse that they're only handling with them is to put a halter on and pull them away from their peers. So I want to see these tests done with horses that have been taught to like enjoy grooming. Now do they enjoy grooming? Does that release other things? Because I think that would change studies and change information because we are not all working with wild horses typically. There's some out there, but we're not generally not all of us are working with wild horses we're working with some sort of our domesticated horses that we've either or tried teaching them that grooming is a good thing or we've reinforced that grooming isn't necessarily pleasurable. So, I mean, I think the reason they're using a lot of the wild or somewhat wild horses is due to them being like a blank slate. Because a lot of the studies 
so like the one that I've referenced a couple times is the way to a man's heart um, is through his stomach. What about horses? And they used a primitive uh, Polish pony breed. And so these are wild raised, a mix of wild raised and domestic raised horses. But the idea is that these are all pretty young. So they're either one or two in this experiment. And I think it's a blank slate is what they're looking at, is that they're looking at a horse that ha- doesn't have any prior experiences with grooming or with um, treats in order to get like unbiased results. See, for me, that doesn't translate over as unbiased necessarily. Like I think it is on one front, but I think there's a complete difference with domesticated horses. I mean, it's I almost look at it not necessarily at the same extremes, but like dogs versus wolves. They have different instincts, different characteristics being wild versus years of horses that have been bred down and like catered towards certain personality traits. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, but I think what you're seeing is that with like, and I would expect the same with a wolf and with a wild horse is that they have the same biological system and the same biological responses and that they're probably going to give you a bigger indicator like a bigger release of stress hormones and that a domestic horse isn't maybe going to release the same amount and it makes it easier to answer your hypothesis and to do the analysis if you're getting that bigger hit and that bigger extreme and then apply it to a domestic horse and say your domestic horse is going to be stressed out he's just not going to release as much of the stress hormones or he is going to be really relaxed he's just not going to release as much of the relaxed hormones Hmm. See, I don't know. That's that's where I'm torn on things. I think, I mean, I think it's based off of the same fact that they have the same biological system, one seen as a blank slate. So any reactions okay. that they get are going to be reactions to the research event versus calling back to a previous experience. Okay, I can understand that, I suppose. I can see where you're coming from. All righty. Well, on that note, guys, thank you so much for sticking with us in our once again, kind of distracted, hazy thoughts of reading so many studies out there and just trying to figure out what the heck is going on with our horse's system, was what's happening, what what even grooming is. But if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, want to suggest us topics, you can reach out reach out to us on Instagram at mudstuds underscore skullcaps. Or you can send us an email at mudstudskullcaps at gmail.com. And don't forget, guys, to check out Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We really, really appreciate all of you guys who have already left one. Stay safe, guys. Stay classy and stay in the saddle. See ya.